For a long time now, I've been thinking about doing sort of episodes about basics of mixology. It's something that I haven't really been talking about much on the show in like over a year, maybe even a couple of years. And you know what? Yeah, I think it's a good time to refresh that subject and revisit it. And so I'm gonna start doing these episodes between other episodes, like as bonus episodes, midweek releases, if you will. And we're gonna kick this whole thing off with today's The Old Fashioned. Let's do The Old Fashioned. Whether you're new to mixology or you've been messing around with bottles for a while, you may have heard that The Old Fashioned is the first cocktail. That's not true, it's a lie. The Old Fashioned is actually an anachronism about the first cocktail. As far as I can tell, the first use of the word Old Fashioned to describe a specific cocktail comes about in like around the 1890s. What is old fashioned about it in 1890? Well, it's the kind of cocktail that grandpa was drinking. It's the way it was back then. It's actually not true. They wanted something that they thought that their grandfather was drinking. Something simplified. Not that city folk fancy sangaree whiskey drink. None of that. I want an old fashioned god dang doodly dee cocktail. And so they came up with this idea that it should have a muddled sugar cube in it and yet also have ice, which is crazy. The idea of muddling granulated sugar of any kind with bitters into a glass goes out of vogue as soon as ice is readily available and for good reason, it won't dissolve. And if you read those descriptions from the 1860s, put some water, put some sugar in there and muddle that together until dissolved, you're making simple syrup in the glass. So they came up with this idea that we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it with ice anyway, because I like ice, everybody likes ice, we have it, it drinks cold better. For their principles, they weren't ready to cross that bridge. Let's get rid of the ice. I have a suspicion was hearkening back to a very specific period. And the reason for that, that I think that is because around that same time, growing a beard became very fashionable for lost causers and, and racists of all sorts. Why? Well, because barbering was one of the few very lucrative professions that freed black men could go into. Uh, a skill he may have picked up in slavery or whatever. I mean, that was rare, obviously, but it was one of the few professions that a freed man could get into and do pretty okay for themselves. And I think that amongst the genteel southerners, there was a bit of a uh, noblesse oblige about patronizing these sorts of establishments, you know? Oh, he's one of the good ones, that kind of thing. And they didn't mind giving him his money. But the minute the emancipation comes around the bend, they got real ornery about having to pay uh, a, <laughs> a black person. And so suddenly, I'm growing a fucking beard became in vogue. Well, I happen to know that bartending was also <laughs> a place where freed black men could make a very nice living, uh, both during and after the uh, emancipation. And I bet some of them were just as ornery about paying them for those services. And as a result, they came up with a fucked up anachronism of a drink that was made all kinds of wrong because they didn't want to consult with an expert. That's what I think happened, okay? <laughs> Obviously, I cannot prove that. I have good sources for the beard thing. I don't have any real sources, just my own inferments about that stuff about the old fashioned. As this anachronistic tradition states, I should be using a sugar cube. Ah, now what kind of a sugar cube should I use? Should I use a domino dot sugar cube or should I use a La Medina brown sugar cube from Mauritius? Uh, probably the domino dot, actually. Rustic and lovely as this may be, I don't believe this is very close to the kinds of sugar that they would have used in the 1890s. It's a great idea. By all means, if you're gonna use a sugar cube, fancy it up, why not? And in fact, because I like my old fashions a little bit on the sweeter side, I'm gonna go for two of these guys, okay? I have often remarked that, boy, I've got a sweet tooth while making this show, and people give me shit about it because they also say, but Greg, the thing that you hate about almost every drink is that it's too sweet, and you fix them by drying them out. That is correct. I have a very different definition of too sweet, right? I still like cake. I'll devour a fucking cheesecake right now. I'll eat the whole goddamn thing. I'm starving. But if I have one or two drinks that are just too sweet, I will feel like shit way before I would ever get to like hangover times. But I don't like my drinks bone dry. I'm not like big on martinis to be perfectly honest, particularly like the dry martini. There's a better way to make a martini, which we will cover in this series of basic cocktails. Uh, so I'm gonna throw a couple dashes of Angostura bitters in here. Angostura bitters, been around a long time, always been synonymous with the old fashioned. Some people will say that the Sazerac is the first cocktail. I did a whole episode about debunking mythology about the Sazerac. I think in this basic series, we'll probably have to revisit the Sazerac. That's not true. It's not the first cocktail. So here we go. Let's add some bitters. Boom, boom, to my sugar cubes. Now I need to muddle that per tradition, possibly with a splash of water. 
which I find to be hilarious. It really depends on who you ask. Okay, we're muddled. Make a nice little paste there. Why did we start with sugar cubes? I don't know. None of this stuff is gonna make sense. So I'm gonna add two ounces of bourbon to this. This to do the Yellowstone. Notice I am leaving my toddy stick in there. Toddy stick is basically the name of a muddler. And when you hear about working behind the stick, you know, oh, he's been behind the stick 20 years. Ain't the tap handle for the beer, it's the toddy stick. The only difference between a toddy stick is that this would have had an iron handle on one end of it. Now I'm gonna muddle that some more. I'm really gonna try and get that sugar as dissolved in there as I possibly can. Believe it or not, we have at least some kind of a suspension of sugar cubes in there. I'm not gonna call it a solution, but they're, they're scattered. Let's get a piece of ice. I'm gonna give that a big stir. I am feeling the edge of this glass. It's getting cold. I'm about done stirring here. I need an orange peel. Take this and pull a twist of orange. At some point when I was a younger man, a twist became synonymous with like a wedge. It's not, the twist is this, it's a peel that you twist to express oils from. And if you were in the 1890s and at a rather fancy bar, you were patronizing one of those excellently skilled bartenders of the era, you might get a flamed orange peel because it's cool. Well, this is not gonna be impressive because this match is terrible, but that was pretty good. What we're doing is we're just singeing the oil peels into the glass there, adding a little smoke, really wring that out, and it's soaking wet with oil. There we go, drop that in there. All those oils go into the drink, those orange oils, boom. And that is an old fashioned. Excuse me, <laughs> I need this. I've been waiting for this for a while. Oh. I gave this drink a lot of shit for its sugar cube, but good damn, that's good. That is wonderful. That's that whiskey. Damn, man. Yellowstone makes a good. <laughs> They're not a sponsor anymore. Not for the moment. I hope they come back. But Jesus Christ. <laughs> God damn good. Now, I'm going to assume that you're looking up how to make an old fashioned either because you've had old fashions and you want to know how to make one or because you've heard about this thing and you wanna learn how to make one so you can try it. Do that, you will like it. As long as you like whiskey. Uh, it occurs to me that if you have a more youthful palate, this might taste like absolute rocket fuel to you. If that's the case, uh, this is probably not the drink for you, but that's okay. What does it taste like if you've got the palate to pull it apart? And I've only got half the palate to pull it apart because I'm not like a whiskey aficionado. What does it taste like? It tastes like char, someone smoking a, a good cigar across the room, a little bit of humidor. It tastes like really dried out, burned up caramel. It tastes like oak. It tastes like orange, for sure. It tastes like peanuts. I find a lot of peanuts in bourbon. I love the peanut presence in bourbon. Some hints of cinnamon distantly. That's coming out of the, the bitters and stuff like that. In episode one of How to Drink, I described it as being like Christmas in a glass. It's a present to yourself and you should give yourself a present every single day. Uh, the only difference is that I would ditch sugar cubes because I think they're silly and just use simple syrup. Because did you see how much work I had to do to muddle that up? And all I did was make simple. It's silly, it's just silly. Let's do it with the, the simple. And how much simple? I would recommend third of an ounce. Let's say a third of an ounce is really the ideal pour. They don't put thirds in these bad boys. Gee, Greg, that's an awful lot. Yeah, I know, I told you, I like things a little sweet. <laughs> One, two and a half dashes of bitters. Those dasher tops have like a recoil on them, so. Two ounces of whiskey. Why not the four roses? I'm just gonna keep mixing it up today. A little ice cube action in there. I did that very poorly, by the way, just a word of advice. If you're gonna drop a big cube into a drink like that that's already got liquor in there, put your spoon in first and lower it down safely so everything doesn't come splashing out. I uh, don't like that. Oh man, that looks cool. Uh, your close-up camera can see all the cool vapors coming out of there. Give that a good stir and then let's pull a peel. And where am I pulling my peel? I'm pulling it right behind the glass, why? So I'm already starting to spray oils just by cutting that. I wanna stay right there. Give it a twist. Should I flame it? Probably it's fun, but these fucking goddamn matches are driving me crazy. And imbibe, enjoy. Huzzah. Oh, that's a fun one. That's so different. I like Four Roses, but I'm liking the Yellowstone a lot more. Yellowstone's got a lot more spice characteristics. This has like a, a faint note of bubble gum in there. Delicious though. Hey, Yellowstone, that was killer. Good God, man. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, that's good. So if the old fashioned was an anachronism, a invented drink as a reaction against a drink that these guys just didn't like, they couldn't get on with it, it was just too god darn new fangled, what was the drink that they were reacting to? Well, it might have been something like an improved whiskey cocktail, which I'm about to make. Would have been made a little bit differently by any bartender. The version I like is the one that is in the Jerry Thomas Bartender's Guide, and you will find it in Imbibe, which is the wonderful book that David Wonders wrote, where he kind of annotated and went through the Jerry Thomas Bartender's Guide from 1864, 
and updated it with modern measurements and gave you a lot of historical context about those drinks. It's just wonderful. It's, it's a Bible for me. It's actually, it's right there. I just can't reach it right now because it's behind a bunch of other stuff. So for this drink though, I am going to make it in a mixing glass. I'm gonna start with the rye. Some seasoned people behind the stick, people with 20 or 30 years behind the stick are gonna say, mm -mm -mm. you should start with your least expensive ingredient first. Yeah, well, that's fine, but this is for me. Uh, and the reason is that if you screw it up, you're not dumping out the expensive stuff. I have never made an improved whiskey cocktail with High West Rendezvous Rye. If I'm not mistaken, this has like a bunch of smoke in it. So this might be weird, but what the hell? The formula remains the same. So two ounces of rye. And yes, for this drink, usually rye. You want a quarter ounce of simple syrup, maybe less, maybe a bar spoon but whatever, do it how you like. I want a quarter ounce of maraschino. This is a sweeter Italian liqueur made from cherries, doesn't taste like cherries. Been around forever, little go a long way here. It's a potent flavor, this stuff. It really can take over a drink. And what I was saying is that it is made from cherries, doesn't taste like cherries. It's closer to amaretto, but there's really no replacing it. There's not like a thing you could substitute for maraschino. I just, for context, if you haven't had it, it's not cherry hearing. It's not a cherry liqueur. Don't reach for one of those. So sometimes I've seen this made with Angostura or Peixos. All of those are valid choices. The way that I am most familiar with it being written up is either with Bogart's or Boker's bitters, which is a, an older form, a type of bitters and aromatic bitters. It's one of those things that was like a lost recipe for a long time. This is the, the Bitter Truth. They make a Bogart's bitters. I, as far as I understand, it's a different spelling of the same name. Two of those, there you go. Look at how good that went. All right, stir that up. Usually this drink is served in a coupe. Um, you can have it lovely on a rock in a, like an old fashioned, wonderful way to have it. I'm gonna have it in a coupe today because we're doing everything else on rocks because I like to be a little different with it. This drink typically calls for a rinse of absinthe, much like a Sazerac. A Sazerac is a version of an improved whiskey cocktail. In the modern era, we can use a spritzer, an atomizer, and that's a really good way to deliver a lot of absinthe, just the right amount of absinthe into a drink without having to waste any and pour it away. This is a great big coupe. It's like a bowl, and uh, that's just one cocktail I put in there, so it's not gonna fill the glass, which is fine. I mentioned that your cocktails would either call for orange or lemon peel. This one, almost always, I've seen it with a lemon. There we go, drop it in there. This is an improved whiskey cocktail, one of my favorite drinks of all time. You could just stop the world and melt with you. Fall right into that drink, it's beautiful. It has a humidor-like taste here that I'm picking up. The maraschino, which tastes like maraschino, so hard to pin down how to break that down into, into smaller elements. Maybe a touch like marzipan with this distant licorice sweetness from the absinthe. Very, 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 very nice. The whole combination here, the whole effect, delicious drink. It has an herbal component that just reminded me of Levi's blue jeans. I don't know why. Those That entire sentence just came out of my mouth like a crazy person an herbal component that reminds me of Levi's blue jeans. You figure that one out. I'm a huge fan of this drink. This is the drink though, that the old fashioned was staking its claim against. And so if you're interested in that, look at that, I put them in matched glassware. If that sort of uh, war between the new and the old, which is weird because this is newer than the old and how that came to be, you want to experiment with it, here they are, right? At the moment, I am preferring this old fashioned to this improved whiskey cocktail. It just happens sometimes. It's a different whiskey, could be a factor, a different rye, you know, the whole thing. I'm gonna salute you with this though. Do you sleep? Sure, we all do. No, the real question is how do you sleep? Because I could sleep hanging from the roof of a cave like a bat or under a rock or in a hollowed out tree. I could sleep deep in the fen of a haunted forest or perhaps in a wooden box surrounded by several handfuls of earth collected from the grounds of my ancestral homeland. But personally, I choose to use a mattress, and fortunately, Helix Sleep is the sponsor of this episode. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses matched to your needs, and they ship them right to your door. You might be asking, matched to my needs? How could they possibly do that? Well, let me assure you right now, it doesn't involve phrenology, the casting of bones, an intimate understanding of moon phases, or pledging your undying fealty to an eldritch power in exchange for inward sight and the ability to better know thyself. Instead, they use a quiz, and it's a pretty simple thing too. Just a few questions to match you up with the right mattress for your sleep type. Since they determined I am a semi-side, semi-back sleeper hybrid, Helix has paired me up with a mattress that they call the Midnight Lux, and I couldn't be happier with it. A couple years on now, and it's still sleeping strong, and since Helix Sleep offers a 10-year warranty, that's not the end of the story on that mattress either. If, however, I wasn't immediately thrilled with my mattress, I wouldn't be forced to seek out the counsel of a bog hag to curry favor with her that she might carry out my revenge fantasy or carve hexes into a sheet of lead while ensconced deep within the bowels of a plutonium sepulcher filled with the intoxicating fumes of a volcanic fissure. Nope, I could just send it back anytime at all during the 100 night sleep trial. 
If something like the Midnight Lux doesn't sound quite as opulent as befits a Dread Emperor such as yourself, you should take a look at their newest Helix Elite. It's a collection of six new mattresses suitable for a most sumptuous bacchanalia. Now, if you find the prospect of sojourning over to a local mattress seller and dealing with the process of in-person mattress buying and selling and hauling to be odious to the point of revulsion, I've got good news for you. With Helix, the mattress comes right to you. Shipped to your front door, rolled up neatly in a box like Cleopatra in a rug, except unlike Cleopatra, when you release the mattress from the box, it will quickly fill with life-giving air and pop itself back into perfect shape right before your very eyes. It may bring you tremendous comfort to know that Helix Sleep mattresses are, in fact, fiberglass-free. Thank you to Helix Sleep for sponsoring this video uh, so that I may dispatch this missive of tremendous import to all of the anyones who are anyone. Helix has a President's Day sale running right now and it's a great time to upgrade your mattress. You can get 25% off of your purchase plus a free bedroom bundle for a limited time. Go to helixsleep.com slash how to drink for more details using the link in the pin comp below or up here in the corner. Thank you again to Helix for sponsoring this episode and now back to the show. So now that I have made the old fashioned that's actually newer, than the new fashioned that's actually older. I want to talk about how the drink is a formula. Let's get out the other not a sponsor, my Remarkable. Please sponsor me. I'm begging you, Remarkable. I love this damn thing. So what is an old fashioned? Because I will tell you that that is not the only way to make an old fashioned, which means that the old fashioned is a formula. It's not a specific drink, it's a formula. And that's the thing about an old fashioned. Is there a wrong bourbon for an old fashioned? Absolutely not. Is there a wrong rum for a Mai Tai? Yes. Is there a wrong vermouth for a martini? Yeah, technically. There's no wrong bourbon for an old fashioned. Honestly, there's no wrong whiskey. You make a rye old fashioned, they're all gonna be an old fashioned. And that's how you know that that's a formula. What is the formula? Well, a lot of people will tell you that it is spirit, bitters, and sugar. I have a corollary to that. It is also, without a doubt, citrus oil. I think that's absolutely necessary. I don't think it's an old fashioned without that. So let's break that down further. So some people would tell you that the spirit has to be whiskey. Um, it doesn't have to be, because like a gin old fashioned can be pretty good. There is a tradition of a gin cocktail, pre-old fashioned, but there's not a great tradition of a gin old fashioned. When you ordered a, an old fashioned, it has always been, as far as I know, understood to mean whiskey. But let's say that spirit is a variable anyway. Today it won't be, today we're only dealing with whiskey. Could it be orange bitters? Technically, citrus bitters, yes, but I think you wanna deal mostly with aromatic bitters. And that's like class of bitters that Angostura is. And that would also include Ango, Peixo, Boker, Elamakule. I don't think that it would be incorrect to use orange bitters. I just don't love it. I think that actually a lot of people say, oh, that's good, what if I add this? Cause it's the same as that. I think that's a mistake. I think you always wanna work from a place of seeking contrast. So if you have an orange peel in there, the last thing you need is orange bitters because it's gonna muddy that up in my opinion. I would say, what, what does it go with orange? Vanilla, chocolate. If you really wanna you know, do something off of the orange, always think about confections, sweet things, candies, because cocktails are sweet candy things. Even when they're not, even when they're dry, they're a treat, they're a candy, they're a confection. Sugar, that's sugar, right? But think of it this way, what if it wasn't sugar? What if it was sweet? So that could be sugar or demerara, which is just another kind of sugar. Could also be a sweet liqueur. Ooh, put a variable letter in there. I think it could also be certain amaros. I think you could get away with honey, although I don't think I would like it. I think it would be acceptable. Anything that you think of as being sweet, I think could be your sweet component there. Citrus oil, lemon, lime, and orange is obviously wonderful. Lime, not so great, questionable. And so you can think about this formula in that way where you can start playing with these pieces and it will remain an old fashioned. I think we can use that formula to come up with some new spins on the old fashioned. We've got to have our spirit. Let's pick a random bourbon. It's funny though, I grabbed so many of these are Yellowstone and then one of them is Old Fitzgerald, which I brought as a point. This makes the best old fashioned I've ever had in my fucking life, but it is rarer than hen's teeth and the bottle's starting to look scant, so I'm gonna put it back here on the shelf. <laughs> so let's start with this Wild Turkey 101 Proofer. Um, and now for a sweet component, let's get away from sugar, right? Let's think about an Amaro or maybe a liqueur. All right, let's do an absolutely insane thing and see if it's good. We're gonna do Wild Turkey and Kahlua. I said a sweet liqueur and I meant it. Kahlua is a sweet liqueur. We're gonna do a coffee kind of an old fashioned here. It's not as crazy as it sounds. Uh, in fact, I've done stuff kind of in that vein in the past. 
two ounces of that. Scant them out there, somewhere between like a third of an ounce. So we've got our sweet and we've got our whiskey. And this is new for me too, this may not work. I'm hoping it does. And I said we needed bitter. Sure, we could use a bitters, an Angostura, I think would be good. I think a chocolate bitters would be good. That's an obvious choice. I've done these drinks with both of those. I've done coffee old fashions using Mr. Black and chocolate bitters and it, it's delicious. It comes out great. What if we went a little askew? I'm looking back at my wall over here. I got a bottle of Suze. I don't think that would be right, but it would be bitter. I got a bottle of Fernet. That would be overpowered. I mean, you'd have to use a drop, just an absolute drop of Fernet, but that could be kind of fun. This might be something I'm gonna call the bartender's old fashioned. I'm gonna use the same dasher top that's my Angostura is on. So it's soaked in Angostura, but we're gonna put one drop of Fernet Branca through it. There we go, that was it. Anytime you try to use a little more Fernet than that, it becomes a Fernet drink, right? It just, it changes the whole thing. Okay, put that on ice. Switch to a glass that's actually gonna work. <laughs> Love these glasses, just the wrong shape for this. There you go. Lemon or orange? I think orange. Orange and coffee go together pretty nicely, pretty nicely. Not like orange and toothpaste. There we go, give that a twisty. Just the inclusion of Fernet and coffee. We'll call this a line cook old fashioned. <laughs> Maybe, if it's good, if it's drinkable. It works. <laughs> it's cool. Oh, <laughs> yeah, man. That's so freaking cool. <gasps> Shit, that's awesome. You get this coffee note up front, mm, coffee. And then that gives way to a sweet orange. All the way through, it's being kind of like, ah, it's got, it's in a fist fight with the earthy bitterness of Burnett Bronco, which I might up by a dash. And then it finishes on these caramel peanut notes of bourbon. Holy shit, that's fun. It's a formula. And once we have a formula for a cocktail, we can kind of do whatever we want with it. We can break the rules. Oh man, that's so cool. I'm gonna try one more dash of this uh, Fernet, and I suppose it's Fernet through a funnel of Angostura, so do with that what you will. Boop, that was it. I think we could have just a little bit more in there. Yep, that's good. That's, that's it, two dashes of Fernet. It's earthy, it's kind of grimy. It's a pirate type drink, but it is in balance and all the parts are working, damn. I am happy about that. That is cool. Let's keep going. This is fun. We are on a quest of discovery now. We are charting courses through bold new lands. And that's what's so cool about an old fashioned. It can be old and new at the same time. So I found a fork in the road. I'm going to take it. I'm going to go grab some other stuff. I grabbed a bottle of Ancho Reyes. Ancho Reyes. It's either really pompous or really valley. I've grabbed a bottle of Ancho Reyes. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, Reyes. It's Reyes. I know. I'm sorry. This is a chili liqueur. It is sweet and spicy at the same time. And I bet we can do a really cool old fashioned with it uh, if we pair it up with... Why not Garrison Brothers? If not mistaken, this is a weeder. So we've got our sweet and we've got our hot, a bourbon. We need our bitter. What's gonna be the bitter? I love Ella Makule Tiki bitters. I just don't think they're gonna stand up to this. I think that they're gonna get a little bit lost. I think Fernet would have been a fun choice, but I've made that choice. So I've got to find new grounds to try out upon. Ah, ah ha ha. Crude small batch bitters. These bitters were given to me as a gift in the secret Santa that the mod of the Discord that my patrons on Patreon get access to, we have a private Discord server, uh, organizes. He does a secret Santa every year. Awesome guy, fantastic, uh, just a, a gem, a wonderful human who runs that thing. And if you want access to that Discord, jump in and get my Patreon. These are cool. I'm actually, I'm not gonna lie. I think there's too many goddamn bitters in the world. I think Ango Peixos and some kind of an orange bitters does, does it for you. But I do fucking love these. These are mm, 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 mm. cardamom and caramelized raisin. All right, let's get a glass. Uh, sure, we'll use the official, like this is a beautiful glass. Look at this thing. This is like heavy, crystal, gorgeous. We're gonna start with this Garrison Brothers Weeder. And now that we've done two of these with whiskey, maybe we should actually venture away from it on our next one and start thinking about other spirits like gin and rum. Okay, about a quarter ounce there of maybe an eighth more. So I've been doing a third as my general pour of our sweet 
and spicy in this particular case. Let's get our bitters in there. A couple dashes of these cardamom bitters. When you have bitters that come with an eyedropper, an eyedropper is a dash. Some people think a drop is a dash. No, an eyedropper is a dash. Let's get some ice. Stir that up. So when you're stirring a drink, when the ice starts getting loose, you know you've done a good job. That's about right. Lemon or orange? I think once again, orange. Here we go. This is, I don't know, a spicy, spicy old fashioned. Let's see if this is awesome. I think it will be. It's a formula. It works. Oh, I think this could be a little bit sweeter. I'm gonna add a bar spoon of simple. Just a, a faint amount because it's definitely spicy enough. The cardamom is present and it works with the, the chili really well. There is a really wonderful thing happening there. But overall, that Ancho Reyes is not as sweet as some other liqueurs. So I think we might want to complement it with a two bar spoons of simple syrup, just to kind of push it over the edge. And there's like a peanutty finish. I don't know if I've just ruined my taste buds and that's like the thing I always pick up. I like it. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah all day. That cardamom thing that's happening and it's sweet, it's delicious. It's like a breakfast pastry. That slides into just the right amount, just a balance of spiciness from the ancho rays. And you feel that down here. It's almost sensorial, less than, than a taste. You get that down here in your throat and around your ears and in your tonsils. Boy, that's awesome, that, that combo. And then that revolves into these orange notes that have, you realize have been there all the way through, but they kind of come to the fore there on that third beat. And then that segues into the peanuts, oak and caramel of the whiskey. It's a formula and it works. It will make you a neat old fashioned. I should say cool because neat implies without ice. It'll make you a cool old fashioned every time. I'm trying to stop burping. Oh man, that's freaking neat, dude. Freaking neat. Ooh, we're having fun. All right, I've done three with bourbon. I hope I've given you a tool that will allow you to make the best goddamned old fashioned you've ever had. And I do wanna point out here now, if you think an old fashioned involves muddling a wedge of orange and a cherry, that is a terrible drink that comes from like the 50s and 60s that we actually often call a mid-century old fashioned now. Um, I speak for the bartending community when I say we. I've also heard it called an old fashioned number two because it's, it's kind of a double entendre. <laughs> it means shit old fashioned. And also like that it's a number two, like it's the second iteration of it. But yeah, that drink sucks. Uh, <laughs> it tastes like Don Draper's ashtray in the worst way possible. I don't know when it comes into vogue. I do know that it has a, a sibling out in the Wisconsin in a Wisconsin old fashioned, which apparently comes in two styles too. I should revisit that. That is made with brandy and orange and cherry. And I think that that might be a factor there, kind of muddling all of that and maybe the dominance of Chicago as a powerhouse of the mid-century. I don't know. I genuinely don't know. But I do know that it's awful. It was the old fashioned that was around when I was a younger man. And I'm so glad it's gone. I'm so glad it's dead because this is uh, a, an inflection point, reviving the old fashioned as it should have been. Don't make that drink. I'm not gonna make that drink. You won't like that drink. This is nothing like that drink. We've done bourbon a few times and rye. Let's do one of rum and one of gin. When I'm looking for a rum to make an old fashioned with, I wanna look for something with some age. Think about like a bourbon. It should be worth noting that an old fashioned is a drink that really puts the spirit on a pedestal. The spirit is the star of an old fashioned. The elements that you add around that spirit in an old fashioned unfold the spirit's flavor profile so that you can access it without having the kind of palate that you would need to access that flavor profile by drinking it neat or on the rocks. You have to abuse your taste buds for years to really get to a point where that's gonna work out for you. And so that's part of it. Like the old fashioned is a little bit of training wheels for neat whiskey. So when you look to a spirit, this is one of the drinks where a higher quality spirit is going to really have a huge effect on the drink. You can certainly make an excellent, wonderful, delicious old fashioned with absolute bottom shelf $12 whiskey. Nothing wrong with that at all, but you will taste the difference on this when you start going up in the dollars. In the dollars! So I am looking at my wall of rum. So we need a sweet liqueur to pair with our rum or a just simple, but that's obvious, right? Like it seems like that is too dagnabbit easy. So one option would be and uh, you know, right, we're using our best judgment here. 
Um, Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth Allspice Dram. Rum and St. Elizabeth go together so well in so many tiki drinks, it's an obvious choice. Another option, in my opinion, would be an Amaro, like Angostura di Amaro, Averna. Lovely. And this guy, ooh. Oh, man. Here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna ignore both of these. I've decided to change my mind, as is my prerogative, because I use this all the time in rum-based drinks, so that doesn't help us, right? Like, the formula is not proven by that. And I use Amaro de Angostura all the time in rum-based drinks. That doesn't prove my formula. I know that's gonna work if the old-fashioned is not a formula, the Saferna. Assuming it's as sweet as I assume it is, let's find out. It's pretty sweet. Is gonna work. Ooh, Averna is a, an Amaro. It's a liqueur from Italy. So that's our sweet. We need a bitter component. Can we do Campari, rum, and Averna? I mean, if we're only using a dash, why not? Let's try it. Campari is a really specific kind of bitter. It's also a very sweet kind of bitter. No, I think Campari qualifies as a bitter. And we're getting plenty of spiciness from that. Two ounces of rum. There we go. Two solid dashes of Campari. You know, there's a lot of things that are like, oh, this bitter spirit, that bitter spirit, and people think that you should use them as pours. But like, I think Fernet in a dasher makes just so much sense. It makes so much sense. That is an overpowering monster of flavor. This is our sweet component. Do a third of an ounce. That third might've been closer to a half. Give that a big stir. So I lied, this glass is terrible for stirring in. Beautiful glass, really cool. Does not stir. We're making it work. Lemon, lime, or orange. We can try a lime. Lime doesn't usually peel or twist very well, but we can try it. You know, we got a little puff of oils there. Okay, let's see how that came out. I don't do a lot of old fashions with lime, but it seems fitting, right? Oh man, there's a cool tobacco-y humidor note that comes in at the end there. That real McCoy's solid shit is good rum. It's getting better and better. That Averna and Campari they open the drink up with this spicy, bitter thing that tastes like older styles of candy. The kinds of candy that like your grandparents liked. You know, like it's got a little bit of, it's got some kind of notes in there. It's not just sweet. It's not just sweet plus one fruit flavor. There's some spiciness to that. There is a twist in there. It goes in directions that you don't expect it to. It's good stuff. Notes of cloves. What is that? Oh man, that takes a really fun turn there. Definitely allspice and mace. Some, maybe some cinnamon, humidor, tobacco. Is the lime showing up? I trust that it is doing its job in brightening this drink. I believe that the more I say it, uh, which calls into question bias, but it's definitely there. I think it's not as loud as a twist of orange would be. Twist of orange is very, it's a potent flavor, it asserts itself. Here we're kind of accentuating the bitterness we are adding to it. It's formula, it works. When you understand the formula of a given drink, and there's really only a few, you can really play around with it. Don't let this stuff be mysterious. It's not arcane. That's fun, I love it. That would be somebody's favorite drink. That's really cool. I'm gonna tell you what, Every single one of these could be somebody's favorite drink because they are all balanced. They all have a unique profile, a unique approach. They are all a little, they have their own thing going on. Every single one of them, we're making it up. We're not doing any research. We're not doing any kind of workshopping, really. We're just using the formula and we're playing around with it. Let's pick a gin. Let's do a gin one. We got our gin. I grabbed a bottle of Monkey 47. What are we gonna pair that up with? I haven't had much use to use this spiced pear liqueur from St. George. I did a quick snart of it once and I was really intrigued by it. That's really fucking cool. It tastes like apple cider. Uh, what do you pair that with? Let's just go with Angostura. Let's keep it simple on this one. Why not? All right, so we've got our stuff, right? So all given equal, two ounces, of course, of our Monkey 47. So we're gonna take our spiced pear. We're gonna do our third of an ounce, a couple dashes of Angostura, an ice cube. So I'm holding the drink from the top here with the two fingers because I don't wanna warm up the glass to the degree that's possible. And also because it looks cool. If I, if I cover it, the close-up camera won't like it. And I'm putting one finger on the bottom so I can feel the wetness and the coldness of my glass. Are these weird mundra hand configurations for arcane and magical purposes? 
necessary in your practice of the arcane arts of cocktailry? No. Do you want to know what I'm doing? Maybe. I do believe that orange is the way to go for this feller. Big twist there. Cut and taste. Very cool orange and spice nose. A little different with gin. Nothing will prepare you for that. I'm sorry, I forgot this was gin based. It threw me for a loop. So in the case of gin, I think you might want to increase your sweetness a little bit. Those unaged, those clear spirits, the ones that aren't brown, they have a very different candor. They present a little bit more brash there, hmm? If you will. A little less um, refined. They haven't quite learned how to light their pipe, if you will. That is a euphemism of the British aristocracy that I just made up. This is a young man who doesn't know how to light his pipe. Uh, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> So I think that's actually undersweet. For me, I mean, technically that's an old fashioned. It is though, however, bright. It has a very light and a fluffy, airy even quality, tinged with cinnamon and spice. And of course the pear from the pear thing. A lot of times when you make a fruit liqueur, usually like a better fruit liqueur, fruit tastes sweet. And a big part of your brain recognizing the presence of that fruit is the sweetness. You're, your tongue wraps around that, and that's how you understand it. When you take a lot of that sweetness away by turning it into a spirit or a brandy or an eau de vie, it gets distant. Yeah, it tastes like pear, but it tastes like dried out pear, desiccated pear, those dried pear rings. It tastes like slicing into a fresh pear and smelling it. It's not the same as biting into a big juicy pear. It's just different. There's cinnamon here. Cinnamon, pear, and allspice here. There is Ooh, orangey and earthiness. It gets better though. It's aging well in the glass here. It's, it's coming into its own. For a minute there, I thought I had to moderate this with some more sweetness. No, I'm not so sure. I probably will before I'm done, but I think that this stands on its own now. It was just, it hadn't lived in its glass for long enough. The gin, the juniper. They're injecting this brightness into the drink that is surprising if it's an old fashioned. You don't expect to find it. And I think that it needs to be tempered with additional darkness. It's as, this drink isn't dark enough. And I think that if we darken up the drink, the character of it, you will find that it brings those gin notes into, into starker relief. So let's throw one more dash of Angostura bitters in there, maybe even a dash and a half, two dashes. I happen to have Fresh bottle of Demerara Simple. I'm gonna do a bar spoon, maybe two bar spoons of this. Specifically Demerara. And I think this drink was fine before from a formalist point of view. It was definitely an old fashioned. It definitely fit all the criteria. It showcased the spirit. But I've been standing here having five or six of these now. And there's a part of me that wanted it to taste more like an old fashioned th that I expected it to be. And so I'm trying to bend it in that direction. This is maybe a very misguided instinct but not for me. For me, that is on the money. Nah, for me, that's on the money. That extra Angostura really brings the cinnamon to the fore, which helps that pear note come out so much. Now it's like spiced apple cider, pear cider, a peri actually, which is a, a cider made from pears. And it's got this Christmassy vibe. Oh man, uh, I mean like this is like a cold mulled cider, you know? This is a wassail served cold. The darker sweetness, that really bottoms it out. That gives it some booty. It gives it some bites, okay? That gives us a foundation to build the drink on. I don't know if it's synesthesia, if it's because, um, and I mentioned this before, when I first started the show, people were like, Greg, you should put up tasting notes. And obviously now the tasting notes are kind of a joke, but originally they were very serious. And originally they didn't even exist. You should put up tasting notes, tell us what it tastes like. And I said, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to describe the flavors. I don't know how to pull them apart. Like I had a great respect for the people who could do that stuff. And I looked into it, and one of the things I saw on like a website about how to become a sommelier was take a piece of classical music, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the whole thing. Pick one instrument, pick an oboe, pick a, uh, a violin, and listen to the symphony from start to finish, listening for that instrument. Focus on it, zero in on it. Um, do it again with another instrument, find the timpani. Do it again with another instrument, find the double bass. Do it again with another instrument, find the, the cello. And that was actually how I practiced tasting because it trains the pathways in your brain on that in a way that you can do with, that works, right? That works, like you have a process there. And so to me, this drink was missing bass. Now it's got some bass. That Demerara is simple, a couple extra dashes of Angostura, 
really gave this drink some base, which is a platform that the treble, which is the gin and the Averna, they can stand on top of, right? And it actually helps all of the flavors work because flavor's like a pyramid. You gotta have that base so that you can put all that other stuff into review. And so now this drink is based. That's so cool. And yes, it's an old fashioned for sure. It totally is recognizable as an old fashioned. You don't lose the gin. You still get the juniper. You still get the Christmas spices. You still get the pear. You still get the cinnamon. It's better. I <laughs> am fall down drunk. Well, that's it for me today, guys. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me while I talked about old fashions, how to make them and how to riff on it, how to take it old fashioned and do your own thing with it, how to reach for any three ingredients and think about them the right way and make them into an old fashioned. Um, I hope that was useful for you. I hope that that opens new pathways for you. I hope that that unveils for you new territories on which to experiment with your arcane arts of mixology and pleasure. And so fun, and so fun for you. And if you're new to the show, welcome aboard. Hit that like and subscribe. Uh, I need you to do that so that my kids can go to college someday. And uh, I hope you stick around. And if you want to see more of the show, well, I'll tell you a little secret. I have been making How to Drink for ever, forever. I was making it and then the internet was born. Here are more episodes of the show for you to enjoy. Please check them out, hang around. I'll be back very soon with another episode of HTD. Good night, good luck, and I love you.